Er ist als innovativer und weltweit erfahrener Projektinitiator, Designer und Manager bekannt. Als Experte wurden seine Theorien in einer Vielzeit akademischen, von akademischen Zeitschriften veröffentlicht, von Themen wie der Zukunft des Internets bis hin zur Umgestaltung strategischer Prozesse. Er arbeitet als leitender Manager im öffentlichen Dienst von Ontario und bei der OECD in Paris. Ähm, unter anderem das Internationale Zukunftsprogramm gründete dann 2005 ein eigenes Beratungsunternehmen Experidox. 2012 wurde er zum Head of Foresight der UNESCO ernannt und beschreibt die Zukunft auch in seinem aktuellen Buch mit dem Titel Transforming the Future – Anticipation in the 21st Century. Er spricht hier und heute über Boundaries of the Mind, Future Literacy and Appreciating Difference. We warmly welcome Dr. Real Miller. Thank you very much. Uh I'm very, very pleased to, to be part of this. Uh, it's a, a privilege uh, and uh, a celebration, in a sense. Uh, I think it's called a festival, right? Um, so I appreciate this, this opportunity to talk about a subject that I think um, has been on my mind uh, for well over 30 years now, uh, which is the future of universities. I uh, conducted my first major uh, in initiative in thinking about the future of universities in uh, 1998 in Ontario. Uh, it was called Vision 2000 at the time. Uh, we were using that convenient date uh, to provide the, the pretext for thinking about the future. Uh, it's often the case that we need a pretext to think about the future explicitly, uh, which is one of the curious aspects of, of the world around us today. And because it's been a topic that's uh, been in the forefront of my mind for a very long time, uh, I felt that this was an opportunity to, uh, to challenge myself, uh, uh, to, to push further in an effort to rethink uh, what, what this is really all about. Uh, and obviously there's plenty of provocations, pretexts for doing so in the current context, Uh, not least of which the, I'd say, genuine uh, sense of uh, fear and disappointment and pain uh, and uncertainty as, a, as a, something that's, that's, that's almost evil, I would say, uh, uh, that's plaguing the university system today in the context of uh, the pandemic shock. The conclusion that struck me the most in 1988 about uh, universities at the time, and we were including all the post-secondary system uh, in our reflections, uh, everything post-high school, was that it was really a signaling system that had uh, emerged, evolved, uh, in ways that were convenient, which is normal in an evolutionary context, which fit uh, the context uh, that there was industrial society uh, and that the value of diplomas, the signals of what people know how to do, what they know uh, uh, on the basis of being in university, what they learn, um, was very thin, very weak, very poor. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't just uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, the diploma in terms of its subject content, but it was very poor in, in the sense that we, it, it was insufficiently rich as a description of what somebody, what their knowledge was, what their predilections were, etc. And part of that was reflected in the whole debate around hiring. Uh, and the utility of learning for people who get hired to a job. And there was data, and I subsequently went to, uh, to, the, uh, to the OECD after that to work on measuring what people know as a topic that uh, was published by the OECD in the 90s. Um, and the, the issue there became how do we think about evaluating and developing a richer understanding of what people know how to do? 
whether it's research or plumbing. <laughs> um, and at the time, this in the 90s, uh, there was a knowledge management became an issue and there was a lot of issues around intangible capital and the question of how people's knowledge uh, moves from one place to another because they move from one place to another. And I was fascinated by, by this, what seemed to me to be fundamentally a signaling problem. But of course, signaling problems are, are, are one of the, the, the most powerful and important uh, aspects of how social uh, societies function, how communities uh, manage to interact. And the, the implications of developing a clearer assessment of what people know how to do had uh, knock-on effects or implications for the functioning of the institutions that are on the supply side and on the demand side, but more fundamentally uh, related to something that was uh, also uh, an important uh, topic and issue, which was human capital. And it's not surprising, uh, my trainings in economics, mm -hmm. that we're familiar with how financial capital uh, is regulated, evaluated, accounted for, measured uh, in ways that obviously enhance its transparency, its allocation, uh, its efficiency. Uh, but human capital remains uh, an, a concept that has been worked on a great deal, that has seen uh, a considerable effort uh, from the point of view of years of schooling uh, and even uh, characteristics of uh, what people know uh, insofar as we provide aggregate measures, such as through PISA. Um, and we make the link, but it remains fundamentally uh, something which is external uh, and is controlled for obvious reasons by, by powerful institutions. Um, on the one hand, universities obviously have a vested interest and a sort of moral hazard. <laughs> related to uh, credentialing and signaling. Um, but so do the institutions uh, of, uh, of government, which are interested in labor markets, and obviously employers who are interested in being in a good bargaining position when it comes to uh, uh, human capital. So the, the angle that, that strikes me today as being central uh, is, is really still this, this same one, is the unpacking of the boundaries uh, and the way in which we, we posit the, the, the thresholds uh, for, in effect, control, ownership, power. Um, and the context in which we live is one that is opening up continuously uh, horizons of potential. So whether it's the tools that we're using, such as the internet, which all of a sudden, I loved the library stacks. I love to go into a library and just walk around with all the books there. Um, but the truth is I haven't done that for years now. And sitting on my laptop is an immense library of books I collect and, and bring into uh, my computer that I'm able to access and search and use uh, willy-nilly. I have access to researchers that I can write, that I can connect up with, that are f absolutely phenomenal. But of course, the real boundary there is, is what I'm searching, what I'm looking for, my research agenda. So it comes down to this aspiration that we have, I think, for the ability to learn, the ability to interconnect, the ability to pull knowledge to, my, to, to, to what I'm interested in and with, where I'm motivated and where I'm actually an effective learner. And all of that, I think, connects up with, with this issue of uh, being able to create open systems for assessing what people know and giving people ownership, as it were, of their human capital. Now, I'm sure most of you will understand that that uh, translates into something that's a rather famous uh, catch to a line from uh, debates of the 19th century, which is the ownership of the means of production. Because of course, human capital is, as everybody says, the most important resource, uh, much greater than uh, any other resource that we know of, uh, maybe except natural capital. Um, and so this implies, obviously, uh, significant contested terrain. How would we identify? How would we uh, attribute? How would we verify? 
how would we create the conditions um, for the openness uh, that would enable this kind of search. And there are obviously institutional ones, and there are obviously you know, procedural, regulatory, due process uh, um, mechanisms. But I want to speak, uh, just in the few minutes remaining, to, to, to the point of capability, which is evaluation assessment uh, and pulling of knowledge to ourselves is uh, very much connected to the way we use the future. Uh, let me explain that. The future serves as a reference point. It serves as our, in many ways, the, the, the point of uh, achievement, what we are going to uh, uh, hope to attain. Uh, and we measure our progress and our efforts with respect to that type of, met, of, of goal. Um, our ability to evaluate something, um, particularly when we don't know, in other words, when we're learning, um, doesn't lend itself very well to an ex-ante definition. Oh, I know exactly what this movie is going to be like. I don't even have to go see it. Uh, I'm going to learn how to do this. Uh, well, I already know how to do it. I don't need to learn it. No, of course not. In other words, there's a fundamental aspect of unknowability related to learning, curiosity, and evaluation and quality. Oh, I know exactly the quality of this meal before I even taste it. No, of course not. And then, do I know how to describe the meal that I've just eaten uh, with the appropriate reference points, with ways which are going to be meaningful to me and to others? In other words, refinement of our ability to evaluate and qualify things all rest on an openness to not knowing. And that's fundamentally something that the future uh, is, is, brings us. It's unknowability. But if its unknowability is considered to be an enemy, if the unknowability of the future is something we're trying to slay because it destroys our planning or ruins our credentialing system because our credentialing system can't accommodate the unknowability, or our project performance, key performance indicators can't accommodate the process as product, the voyage as the discovery of something that was unknowable in advance. In other words, if it excludes fundamentally what's learning, uh, then I don't think we can do any of this evaluation or the kind of pull learning that I think is what we need uh, if we're going to be able to enjoy and find meaning in one of the most fundamental avenues for finding meaning, uh, which is learning. So futures literacy, which is this capability that relates to understanding different systems of anticipation, is actually a fairly fundamental enabling component of changing the boundaries of our minds. Uh, it's something that, that we need to be able to understand uh, as uh, uh, something that's innate to all humans. We all anticipate, and we anticipate in many different ways. But up until now, we've been basically um, so uh, uh, easily uh, uh, in our own way of thinking about the future, whether we're crossing the road or setting up an appointment or wondering about uh, a utopia or being particularly uh, ambitious about something we want to achieve, uh, we want to win uh, this outcome, uh, that we haven't stood back and said, how does that way of using our, our ability to imagine the future, because the future is always imaginary. How does that way of using our ability to imagine the future restrict and reduce our perceptions in the present? And I'll just use a silly kind of uh, example, but imagine if, if, if we'd uh, said, okay, you can only use words from the dictionary that are already in the dictionary. You can't invent any new words. Nothing, we won't allow you to describe with a new word anything that occurs in the world around you. Uh, and let's say we'd done that, you know, a thousand years ago, or a hundred years ago, or ten years ago. Uh, uh, it's obviously ridiculous. We have to invent new words. Uh, and in that same sense, imagining the future purely on the basis of past language, past images, past projected into the future, uh, which gives us a sense of security, because we know what it is, and we can create models, and we can create closed models, because we can fit the, the data, and project into the future in very, a variety of different and creative ways. But nevertheless, that extrapolatory, predictive, probabilistic risk 
as dis risk as distinct from uncertainty way of approaching the future precludes because it focuses it draws our attention to certain things and this is again where it's crucial to understand the power of the future because the future is so uh, uh, important for everything we do if the images of the future we have are 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 in some sense uh, you know almost with, with a great deal of anxiety oriented towards being right towards winning the future towards colonizing tomorrow towards fulfilling the, the the slogan of let's say the 1990s is the best way to predict the future is to create it like you're some creator of the future magic wands and engineers of tomorrow um, if that's the 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 soul orientation then for me uh, the metaphor i like to use is that we're hopping around on one leg uh, it's not that we don't make bets and it's not that we don't need to make risk assessments nobody's saying that but to exclusively use our anticipatory capacities in that way precludes uh, because it just doesn't enter the picture um, the things that make no sense based on yesterday's dictionary and in order to use the human capacity to be creative our imaginations to invent those new words which we're very capable of doing um, we need to be able to loosen the hold of predictive futures and colonizing tomorrow on our minds and this is an entry point for curiosity it's an entry point for being able to understand quality better uh, and so that's that's uh, the basic uh, propositions here um, it's about how futures literacy I believe is a crucial precondition it's a necessary not sufficient condition uh, for uh, going beyond the boundaries uh, of the past and in a sense as you probably uh, gathered from the abstract that I wrote for this this talk envisions in a speculative scenario type way um, the idea of the dissolution uh, in a sense of the university as a bounded bastion of power and becoming something that is ambient uh, and available to everybody uh, and let me just add a little uh, kind of footnote on that point which is that the kind of creativity I'm talking about the discovery the learning is available to everybody a baby learns and in fact uh, I was thinking this morning as I was like, that, that I don't know how many of you have it in your head at the moment but have you ever seen a baby that's just learning to walk and how thrilled they are they're just like bowled over um, of course, we, don't, we know that the trouble's just begun because now that they can explore, they might, <laughs> they might go all over the place. But that moment when we learn, when we know how to walk on two legs and we have, we're more agile, uh, we're more uh, mobile uh, and we can explore is, is, a, is, a, is a moment that I think is inscribed in our, in our, uh, our consciousness and in our, in our awareness. And I think futures literacy and the university is an ambient learning society uh, uh, captures that uh, emotion and that capability quite well. So thank you very much. Be glad to take questions. Sorry, I can't hear you. You can't hear me. Now I can hear you. Now I can hear you. Perfect, perfect. And thanks again, uh, Dr. Miller, for your inspirational keynote. Uh, I just saw two questions popping up. The mm -hmm. first one is by Stuart MacDonald. What would a future ambient university look like? Um, as you may have gathered, I'm not, I'm not big on prediction. Um, I'm not that interested, actually, in... You know, what the future will be like I'm more interested in the present uh, uh, and how the future influences the way we see the present and since the, the idea of the future keeps changing you notice that recently uh, our idea of the future changed a lot with the uh, COVID and teleworking and all the rest um, our ideas of the future and our scenarios and the images are con constantly changing but if I think about the ambient university today uh, what it what it speaks to is uh, the issues that I that I touched upon in terms of power in terms of uh, uh, assessment in terms of uh, accounting uh, and the ability to uh, help render transparent and owned uh, what people know how to do and I think we're very close to being able to do that 
um, uh, in the same way that the telephone, which has been around for a long time, is currently serving. Uh, I was just on a university course where there were 45 students who didn't open, put their video on. They just listened to the course that two of us were giving. Well, we could have done that by telephone, you know, 50 years ago, but we didn't. Uh, and so there's a lot of potential in the world around us today, for instance, to enhance very significantly uh, the ability to evaluate, the ability to signal, the ability to take responsibility, the ability to take um, credit. And therefore, credit is an intertemporal concept about value in the future uh, with respect to what people know. Uh, and we could do a lot of that but we're not. Uh, instead, we're panicking about whether or not we can teach lectures in lecture halls, uh, which is a rather, uh, from my point of view, uh, sad example of an inability to change the image of the future, which happens to be fixed on the idea of being in a lecture hall. Um, it's it's, uh, it's what, we, what I call poverty of the imagination. And if I can segue into the other uh, question, which is about how to do this, UNESCO and, and throughout my career now has been about practice, <coughs> designing processes, excuse me, <coughs> where people learn uh, about their anticipatory systems. And so it's really not that difficult uh, in the following sense. Uh, when you explain to somebody who uh, doesn't know how to read and you say, you, you, you hear the words you're, that I'm saying right now or the words that you're saying, you know, we can actually write those down. They're going to go, oh yeah, okay, so you can write those down and you can read them later and you can send those words to somebody else. That's what it means, taking language that's spoken and putting it into writing. Well, the anticipatory systems that we use all the time, uh, am I meeting my friends for dinner? Uh, am I uh, you know, hoping to go to university so I can get a job? All those anticipatory systems uh, are things that we can render explicit. And we can also render them much more uh, comprehensible in terms of where they come from and how they influence our hopes and our fears, our motivations and our perceptions. So futures literacy as a capability is a very innate human capability because it, 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 it's on, on the foundation of anticipation, which is crucial, uh, which is, which is you, you can't live without anticipation. Um, and so we're in a position to build futures literacy through very practical means. And in fact, there are currently 20 UNESCO chairs uh, in future studies, futures literacy that are using a whole wide variety of means in order to develop people's capabilities around understanding anticipation and applying the future. So futures literacy is something that's uh, kind of uh, emerging uh, as an, uh, an idea whose time has come, if I can put it that way. There's going to be a summit at UNESCO uh, in December that will be uh, around the topic of the uh, futures literacy as an essential competency for the 21st century, uh, in part because poverty of the imagination can have some very negative effects, such as despair, <laughs> such as zero-sum gains, the inability to imagine uh, things that we could do together. And so this, this is, is something that is at once a theoretical and uh, research-based uh, endeavor that relates to the systems of our whole society but at the same time, a very practical thing driven by need. So and I'll finish on this point with, with respect to those two questions. One of the reasons that futures literacy becomes so salient is that people have had their images of the future ripped away from them. And, you know, you're ripped away because you have a COVID pandemic shock. Uh, and then you say, well, who, who can give me my new image of the future? Well, you realize that it's not quite that simple, uh, that's not very credible if somebody just slaps on a new image of the future. Uh, and that, in fact, the whole way in which we approach the images of the future and incorporate them into our sense of security and our sense of adaptability and resilience is actually inadequate. And that's a, a very powerful lesson, I think, of this pandemic shock, which is that uh, the way we approach the future has helped to create the fragility that the pandemic shock has exposed because we remove ourselves from our relationship to nature. We remove ourselves from uh, uh, humility with respect to the future. And we think we can control it and colonize it and engineer it. And as a result, we build fragile systems, which then break. There is a chance, chance. of waking up. Um, we have just uh, two minutes left for the last question. We will make this really quick. Um, the question 
is by Goran Lazarevich. Thank you for the great talk. Could you please give us your comment on the following quote? The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, that uh, that's a, uh, a, a, absolutely right. Uh, I think the challenge is to understand how to do that. Because the desire to learn, unlearn, relearn, to forget, to remember, and all the rest, our approaches to that are still, I think, well below our capability uh, uh, as a strange, a strange species that is able to imagine and imagine and tell stories and create meaning and share meaning. So from my perspective, uh, we're maturing rather slowly uh, and with uh, the kinds of bruises and bumps that are, uh, I think, accompanied the, that accompany the, the, the learning experience of becoming wiser. But that would be uh, actually kind of the bottom line in the sense that embracing the proposition that wisdom remains an important objective uh, is something that, that uh, I think we need to embrace. And that means, in some senses, to go back to the university and schooling issue, fundamentally we need to rethink the, va the basic processes and relationships of learning in our society and move significantly, break significantly from the industrial era despite its immense success with standardization, with obedience, with uh, taking care of children so that parents can go to work, we have unbelievable potential here uh, to, to create a learning society. If we experiment and appreciate those experiments uh, in the present. I'd like to add one quick last question, although we are already running out of time, but it's really interesting. Uh, Sandra Wiegand is writing, you mentioned KPI, key performance indicators. How can they correlate with future literacy and foresight? It's a very good question. And there's, of course, uh, everything depends on your definitions. Um, because a performance indicator can be rethought uh, to be about uh, learning by doing and process as product and the voyage. Uh, the difficulty is, is that we're in an input-output framework uh, where we want to have control. Uh, and and that, uh, that, in some sense, uh, violates the basic proposition uh, of complexity as not, a, con not something that goes up and down. That's complicated and simple. Complexity is a state. We are in a complex universe that has the one certainty, which is uncertainty, and therefore creative, unknowable things in advance will happen all the time. Incorporating that into KPI is probably a, a, a bit like a force fit. Uh, so m the proposition that I would have, and it's part of in Transforming the Future, the, the book I put out in 2018 through UNESCO, is that we distinguish uh, two different, that's the two legs metaphor. Uh, and we understand that there's one leg which is really I I embracing the spontaneity, the ephemerality, the creativity. Uh, and is, is open to that and not fixed in its idea of the future. And then there's the other side, which is the management, critical path planning, uh, closed systems thinking that assesses risks and makes uh, choices on the basis of probabilistic estimates that are possible when you have a closed system uh, model. Uh, and we understand that we've got both legs and that there's a relationship between both legs. But we're very, very deeply biased to one side. And I would point out that as we exercise the other leg, if we if we manage to do that through futures literacy. Um, it'll take time for the muscles to build up. We're just at the beginning. Uh, and the relationship between the two legs is something that also has to be understood. Because in our brain, the, we, and you again to take the child uh, example, at the beginning, the child really doesn't know how to connect the two legs up and there's kind of that imbalance and they're, they're teetering along. And eventually they figure, okay, this is how the two legs work together. The same for stereo when it comes to our eyes. So we are, in a sense, in the same way that universal compulsory schooling was about universal reading and writing, today, as we try to embrace this idea of universal futures literacy, we're just at the beginning of understanding what it means, uh, what it can, how to do it, and appreciating rather from an outcome, not from an outcome perspective of some set goal, but from the perspective of capability, saying if we change the conditions of change, we open up new horizons without colonizing the future, but appreciating that we've created more potential, more capability, we've opened windows and doors and the ability of people to imagine and use their imaginations more effectively. So that would be my thought on that.
KPI. Now